I'm Tom Addington here on behalf of Ethan Walton, and I'm one on one with our good friend Mike Grain. Mike, welcome. Thank you very Thanks much, for Tom. Coming. We have known each other for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. actually, and uh, first met in the context of Procter and Gamble mm -hmm. and the original partnership that was formulated between this large, well, at that time, really not necessarily a huge retailer called Walmart. They mm -hmm. certainly weren't the largest. And this huge consumer products company called Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. uh, before, we, before we rewind that timeline and find out from you, since you were here from almost the very beginning of that, what, what that was like, what, what that partnership was like as, as you put together and formulated a model, a template, a relationship with Procter & Gamble and, and a huge retailer. Give us a little sense of your history with Procter & Gamble. Okay, sure. Um, I joined uh, Procter & Gamble in 1982 directly out of college after getting my master's from the University of Cincinnati uh, and joined the food service and lodging products division. It's basically the division that don't, they don't, we've re renamed it probably four times since then, but it was basically making small bars of soap for hotels and motels and coffee for restaurants and all those other kinds of things. So I spent about three years in that and really, really enjoyed trying to figure out how to get our products to market with restaurants and things like that. Um, I moved into a, I have an information systems degree and therefore all of my career um, assignments have been information systems related. I de they decided that I need to go have some managerial experience so I got to go over and manage our corporate data center in Cincinnati where I had about 20 people reporting to me and they basically kept all the computers and networks up for that. And then I spent uh, one more assignment in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where we have a manufacturing plant, and I was the information systems manager there. So I had no idea you mm -hmm. were Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And then? And then I was supposed to be at Cape Girardeau for about five-year assignment, and they called me after about two years and said, we have another opportunity for you. And they said, what kinds of things have you enjoyed so far with P&G? And I said, well, I really enjoyed the food service and lodging because it was up against the business. I would really, really enjoy my time here in Cape Girardeau because it was up against business and real business problems and the application of information systems to solve business problems. I said, I didn't really like the last assignment because it was all just you know making computers run and people sometimes forgot we were actually a soap company and they thought we were a computer company. So I really want to be up against the business and up working with customers. And my boss just smiled and he said, boy, have we got a deal for you. I said, okay. He says, how would you like to move to Fayetteville, Arkansas? I said, Fayetteville, Arkansas? There's one in North Carolina. Is there one in Arkansas too? And they said, yes, Fayetteville, Arkansas. I said, well, do I have a plant there? He said, no, we have a customer there, Walmart. And I'm going, when I said I wanted to work with customers, I meant salespeople, marketing people, finance people. We actually got people calling on customers. No, not yet, but you get a chance to do that. So that was kind of how the whole c whole story went down and uh, loaded the family up there and we were down there in March of 89, which is when we started. Hadn't heard of Fayetteville, Arkansas, but you heard of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Correct, and because we had a large it, paper plant there, yes. Okay, yeah. and and you came here and you have worked here, so you, you came here in what, about 89 or 90? Correct, March of 1989. March of 1989, we, we arrived almost exactly at the same time. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and, um, and when you retired just recently from Procter & Gamble, what was your title and what were you doing? Uh, when I retired from Procter & Gamble, I was the Director of Information Systems for the Procter & Gamble and Walmart relationship. The, the term that most of the suppliers use in the community now is the local chief information officer or CIO for the supplier and Walmart teams. So Mike, uh, give us a little, uh, you have watched this whole, literally this whole world develop and you have been in the middle of the mix of helping develop what that relationship and what that interface looks like between a manufacturer or a supplier mm -hmm. and Walmart on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you know, lots of stories have been told, books have been written on this because Procter and Gamble and the team that you were on from almost the very beginning 
um, really was the team that developed that template and model, which has now been replicated across um, the Walmart world mm -hmm. um, and so on. So it'd be it'd be great. Just give us give us a little bit of a sense, some story of this or that of, sure. of, of, of how that how, how that developed. Sure. Um, the, um, the the interesting part of the whole thing is I've found over my career that most companies don't make major substantial changes unless they're in crisis mode. If things are going along pretty well, it's really hard to get companies to make major interventions about the way they do things. Peter, Peter Drucker told me one time when I was talking to him that most companies, just in alignment with what you said, most companies make major changes. I said, I said, so do they make changes primarily out of a profit motive? He said, absolutely not, Tom. He said they make, most companies make major changes out of pure fear. Hmm. Crisis That's, mode. Yep, crisis mode. They're going to lose market share. Things aren't going to work. They're going to lose out some somehow. Correct. And that's why they change. Correct. So you're saying most companies do it that way, but. Uh, and that was the case. No, not but, but that was the case in our situation as well. And, and I'm sure the story has been told many, many times by a lot of people who uh, are very articulate and can put it in the books. But the basic premise of the story was Procter & Gamble was a great company. And they did a great job of manufacturing products. First off, understanding consumers' needs and manufacturing products to meet those needs. And then doing a wonderful job of really marketing those and reaching the consumers with that message about, we want you to buy this product and this is what it will do for you. Mm -hmm. And of course it was pretty easy when there was ABC, NBC, and CBS and that was basically marketing, right? And, and a few uh, soap operas that they actually sponsored, et cetera. So they did a great job with that. What they didn't probably do as good a job is the customers that who actually bought that product. Now I'm saying customers, not consumers. The customers, or we used to call them the trade, that actually purchased that product. It was almost like that's the sales organization's job. The sales organization deals with that. Um, and and it, it was unwritten, but it was almost like they were a necess unnecessary evil because you got to go deal with customers because they're always asking for stuff, et cetera. Well, you know, we had a uh, we had a sales manager by the name of Lou Pritchett who was actually running uh, Asia came over to be our sales manager for the United States, and they started looking at some of these you know sales numbers and they're finding out like the number five customer is this customer called Walmart and it's like who is Walmart they I've never heard of them before when I when I came, you know when I left I never heard them before now they're our number five customer. Who knows anything about them? And of course, we were organized primarily by divisions. So we got a sales manager for Florida area or California or New York. So nobody looked at a customer that spanned across the entire United States very well. Mm. Uh, so nobody knew anybody, anything about them. So uh, Lou decided to take it into his own hand uh, and said, I'm going to go out and reach out to Walmart. And it was about the same time where Walmart was really, really frustrated with us. We were basically had people in 10 different cities that would fly in, make sales calls on buyers, fly back out. They'd never met each other before, so the buyers would ask very simple questions about how you handle things. They'd get a different answer from every salesperson mm -hmm. who, who they talked to. We were very adversarial. We were very transactional. It was, you know, what's the, what's the purchase order? We get the purchase order today. Uh, it's very short-term, near-term focus. So, Walmart didn't appreciate working with us very well, and frankly, P&G didn't like working. Matter of fact, we've got one of the first videotapes that we first put everybody together in a focus group, and the P&G people did not like the Walmart people or vice versa. It was just so obvious you could just you know, sense it with an eye. So um, it, it, it sort of culminated where Sam Walton actually um, tried to give us what's called the Vendor of the Year Award, which is a very prestigious award if you were a supplier. And he called our senior executives to try and award that. He actually called our CEO, and the CEO at the time would not take Mr. Sam's phone call. So he got routed around from desk to desk to desk up in the 11th floor, and finally somebody said, look, you know, we don't talk to customers. And that was about the time Lou Pritchett got a hold of it and said, I'm going to go down and meet Mr. Sam. And uh, they strongly suggested not to meet him in the office, but instead he's going camping and doing a float trip next weekend. Why don't you just go with a float trip, which is, for those of you who don't know, that's kind of, for Arkansas, it's basically a canoe trip, but we call it a float trip. Uh, but they did that, and during the breaks, they had a chance to talk about it. You know, it's a shame, and Mr. Sam said, it's a shame that two big companies like ours don't like working with each other. And it's a shame, because if you thought of your company, Lou, Procter & Gamble, as an extension of my stores, you would treat us a lot differently. Mike, but how many customers at that time, retailers, would have thought they liked working with P&G? 
Uh, probably not very many. Okay. Probably not very so many. So it wasn't an isolated example no. of relationship kind of sour. Definitely not. Definitely not. And, and, you know, if we had to do it over again, we probably would have the same relationship with Joe's IGA in Des Moines, Iowa. But Joe's IGA in Des Moines, Iowa doesn't buy a whole lot of stuff from us. Walmart was getting to a point where their volume was starting yes. to be a significant impact sure, to our sure. business. And not only were they a big part of our business, but they were a growing part of our business. So float trip. Float trip. Interaction. Um, interaction. Great time. Great discussion. Uh, very positive. And at the end of it, Lou actually invited Sam Walton and his leadership team to a two-day session in Cincinnati because that's just about the time we were really getting involved with Total Quality. Went through customer re supplier relationships and Venn diagrams and all the other stuff that we had in, in the Total Quality re realm. And after the end of the two days, we thought we were just doing a good thing to give this training. Mr. Sam looked at, at the time our CEO and said, okay, when do we start? And he said, Start what? He says, well, this total quality thing between our two companies because we obviously are not doing this thing mm -hmm. right. And so at the time, um, our boss, Tom Muccio, actually was assigned as the global team leader for the P&G and Walmart relationship. Um, and he needed, he identified that he needed somebody in sales and he needed a supply chain logistics manager and he needed a finance manager and he needed a marketing manager and he needed uh, an information technology manager. And uh, I guess I got the short straw, <laughs> and I got the phone call in Cape Girardeau saying, your five-year assignment is now a two-year assignment. Move to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and we want you to start up the Walmart team. Amazing. That is just, that, that, that is an amazing story. And so you've seen it develop over all those years. Yes, I have. Um, you are an expert in information systems and processing. That's what you have, that's how I've known you mm -hmm. from the very beginning of, um, of our relationship. Um, and as it just so happens, when, as, as, that, as that template was developed initially and it's gone through evolutions and it's gone through maturity since then, that information systems and processes part of the equation turns out to be very, very important. Mm -hmm. So for those who might not understand uh, fully what that means, what role specifically, I mean, if, 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 what role specifically does that play given that part of, the, um, part of the model and part of the template that was developed was that where prior to this new way of doing things, when Walmart and P&G didn't like each other well, it was basically a very simple interaction between a buyer and a salesperson, buyer on Walmart side, salesperson on on the uh, supplier side, um, the new model called for a very different kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And there was a cross-functional interface and interaction across that interface uh, on a case uh, on a function by function basis. So marketing would talk to marketing, finance and accounting would talk to finance and accounting all the way down, including obviously information um, systems and processes. So mm -hmm. it was a multi functioned interface and at the core of that is the uh, information systems and processes part. Mm -hmm. You can't do it without that. Right. What does it consist of? Well I think it consists of everything that touches the supplier and the retailer um, engagement if you will. So you know probably a good good example would be when we first started working with each other um, we had tremendous amount of data in our systems about what we shipped to our retail customers. So we knew everything we sold to them, everything we shipped to them, et cetera. The retailers on the other ha side had from the time they received the product all the way till it flowed through to the, to the register, to the customer who put it in their basket. And so a classic example of this was um, our first opportunity I got a chance to present our total business to the P&G and Walmart team. And I got to tell them that congratulations, last year we did over 17 million statistical cases together. And the Walmart people went, what the heck is a statistical case? And I said, well, you got a great big box of detergent and a little tube of toothpaste, you got to equate them, so that's our way of equating. And you know, after real, it was real obvious, you read the body language, they really didn't care. And they said, Mike, in all due respect, I don't know what a stack case is and I don't think I care. As a matter of fact, I don't even necessarily care what you ship to me. 
and I'm going, great, it took me two months to get this, and you don't care, that's great. If I had a cell phone, it's like, don't unpack, honey, we're not gonna be here long, one of those kind of stories. And they said, here's the problem. The problem is we want to know how much of your product we sell in our stores. And by the way, we don't make enough money on you guys. When we buy your products, we don't make the kind of margins that we're looking for. And I said, well, what do you make? And they said, I don't know, but it's not enough. So it's like, well, I don't know what to do with that other than it took me a while to get this information. So I'll tell you what, let's, I'll go get the data. Mm -hmm. Made a phone call to the CIO. We went and got the data. It turned out it was a very bad profitability situation. So for the first time ever, we for got who? Have, for them? For, for them. You. For, for you. them. So for the first time ever, we got to see not only what we shipped to them, we shipped you 100 mm -hmm. cases, but how many of those cases actually translated into sales at the register for them and how much margin they made and profit they made when that was actually put into somebody's mm -hmm. basket. Well, that's a whole new world. Now our sales folks are thinking, well, not only do I have a sales mm -hmm. quota I have to do, but the buyer I'm working with has a sales and profit margin as well. We need to look at this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that was the first opportunity to save, of sharing data back and forth. And literally, Tom, within the first eight months, we made a $50 million swing in profitability in terms of Walmart making $50 million more million than they did the previous year because we had the data. And Our salespeople didn't know. And, and the $50 million swing came out of your hide? P no, side? no, it actually didn't. They, you know, a lot of people was were suspecting that, but they would do, for example, they would take the absolute best-selling skew of diapers they could find that they end up competitively pricing in the marketplace to a point where they would almost lose money on it, and they'd create full walls of display of those products. Well, that was like turbocharging loss. Every time they sold one, they were losing money on it. So what we started to do is say, well, if that's what you're trying to do, we got some SKUs that we think we could put in place that you'll make a little money on. Let's go put those on the full wall this way. I think that, and that's, so, a, that's a great illustration of the power of this new relationship, right. which up to that point, to my knowledge, really wasn't manifested anywhere. This is like the first time this has been done. Now,